The first time I was deported, I was 17 years of age. I was living in a boarding house in Los Angeles, California, and you might remember, it was around 1950. And it was the time of the McCarthy era and Better Red Than Dead. And I got into this argument with an accountant who wore one of those uh, pins, Better Red Than Dead, and he always was denigrating FDR. And I knew nothing about politics, George, but I was defending him and, and saying that, you know, his father must appreciate that FDR got Social Security passed and that, uh, and that Hoover was actually the one who caused the major depression. And I'm traveling around L.A. and I see golf courses named after FDR. I find schools. I said, but the only thing named after Hoover was a vacuum cleaner. So anybody, everybody at the table laughs. He gets up and he calls the cops. He called the FBI and said that I was a commie. And within 10 minutes, there were like six FBI agents at this little boarding house resting this 17-year-old kid. They took me downtown. They did research on me. They found out I'd only been arrested and charged with thievery in Canada, that I was no threat to the United States, and turned me over to immigration naturalization. And this was at Terminal Island near Long Beach. It was a minimum security facility. I was there for three months and I wanted to escape. And I'm on the third floor. And I am befriend the Mexican kid next to me in charge with gathering up all the laundry to put in the chute and send it downstairs. It was a Wednesday. I'd showcase, I, I'd, I'd case the place for months and how to get out of here. Minimum security. I, there were two doors. There was one to the bus stop and there was one to the beach where if I couldn't get to the bus stop, I was going to jump in the water and join the Merchant Navy or something. I couldn't stay locked up. So the day it happened, they put me in the laundry chute. One of the Mexicans pretended to faint, so the guards were distracted, sent me down the laundry chute. I go down in the dark, just terrified, land on all the dirty laundry. I get up, I'm thrilled, and I rush to the door to open, and it's locked. I rush to the door to the lake, and it's locked. And I do this for an hour and I can't understand what's wrong. I sit down in the garbage and I fall asleep. I'm awakened by a guard who says, oh, look at this, a live body in dirty clothes. What are you trying to do? And I didn't lie, I said, I'm trying to escape. <laughs> so he howled and he said, well, come on with me, young man. And I said, well, hold it. Why are all these doors locked? It's Wednesday, he says to me, it's July 4th. It's an American holiday, kid. <laughs> so I'm. I'm devastated and the thing they want to know is who helped me and I wouldn't tell who helped me. So all the Mexicans, my nickname became Julio Cuatro after that. But 20 years later to the day, I get a note from the guard who stopped me. And he says, are you the same John Barber that I dragged out of the dirty laundry? Because my friends don't believe me. And I sent him back an eight by 10 glossy of me wearing a $600 suit, hosting real people to show that I'd created. And I thanked him for finding me because I had been looking for him to thank him. Because I told him if he had not stopped me, I wouldn't be sitting on this stage next to Sarah Purcell wearing a brand new $600 suit. <laughs> See, if you weren't a commie, you would know it was July 4th. <laughs> <laughs> well, the truth is, when I was deported again a second time, but I became an expert on immigration law. I was as good as any lawyer in the United States. I spent hours and hours at the University of Toronto Law Libraries, and the rest is history. Tell me this, you're here at a convention that primarily is a UFO event, but deals with a lot of other topics. Are you in the, are you in the right place? Or do you fit with this, this crowd? What a wonderful question. I was here to screen my film, The American Media and the Second Assassination, President John F. Kennedy, which got a terrific reception. I opened it by saying, it's proper that I might call this film UFO, Uncovering Fascist Operations. And of course, they cheered. And people ask me, are you interested in UFOs? And I say, definitely I am. Who wouldn't be? Because there's so much evidence that maybe they actually exist. My webmaster believes in it. I'm the biggest fan of George Knapp, who's you. And I said, he, he covers that stuff extensively. But I stay away from it for one reason. Too many conspiracies. Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, John Lennon. 
I focus only on Jim Garrison and the John Kennedy murder, which he solved, because I feel that is the linchpin. If you unravel that, you unravel everything else, including the cover-ups about UFOs. It's the same mechanisms are used. Absolutely. 911 also. Uh, same people involved, same agencies, same reasons. Absolutely. Control. Absolutely. Uh, your book. Uh, so I was expecting more about Garrison. I mean, it, it, you do go into Garrison, of course, but I was expecting more of a focus. This is a not only a, a not autobiography, but a showbiz story. It's about. It's it, a, his, I, I hate to say this about my own book. I think the best book ever about show business or anybody in it was Ben Hex, A Child of the Century. Highest paid screenwriter in history, wrote Gone with the Wind in 12 days and never read the book. He just read a synopsis. He became the first propagandist for the unborn state of Israel, a spectacular book. This, though, is by far the best book written about anybody in show business. It starts off like David Copperfield and ends up like Neil Simon. Uh, it, it's a one, and, and there are no chapters in it. It's assembled like a series of uh, columns in a newspaper. You could open it anywhere and read a great story. Let's say you're interested in the gong show. I was the first person gong as the host of the gong show. You go to that and you'll read a fantastic story. Or if you're interested in Frank Sinatra, and I became a private writer for three and a half years. And the first time I saw him, George, I was 16. I was at the Cal Neva Lodge when I'd run away from Canada to come here to be a gambler. And guess who walks in the casino? Frank Sinatra with his overcoat draped over him like a Superman cape. He is with Sam Gincana. I just read about this gangster from Chicago in the newspaper. And there are three Italian Praetorian guards walking behind them. A week earlier, I was in the Manor Theater on Kingston Road paying a nickel to see Frank Sinatra in the Jerome Corn story, and he's on this white pedestal singing, as good as anyone, Old Man River. There he was walking into my life, and 20 years later, I was his private writer. Frank Sinatra was a deity in the town that is now your home. That's right, and I love him. My, my wife said, I'm so glad we moved to Las Vegas, because like your mouth, it's open 24 hours a day. <laughs> he was a tough guy to love, though, wasn't he? Yes, he was, uh, and the story about how I met him, it was for the second revival of Laugh-In, and he came in as he does with a bunch of people, and he was handed material by George Slaughter, the uh, co-creator and owner of Laugh-In, and Mr. Sinatra would look at something, throw it on the ground, and curse, who wrote this crap, who wrote this crap? And then Digby Wolf, who was the actual creator of Laugh-In, as this drunken, Englishman who was a brilliant comedy writer, he said, here's some other stuff. Well, Mr. Sinatra started to read it. And he said, this is funny, this is funny, who wrote this? When we did laughing, there were no audiences, it was all canned laughter, but I was so afraid of Mr. Sinatra, I was sitting in the back of the studio, and he said, who wrote this? And Digby said, Johnny, he's up there. And Mr. Sinatra turned around and he looked up, I'm 46, and he says, hey kid, Come here. So I come downstairs. He said, you wrote this? And I said, yes, sir. He said, "What? you're the critic on NBC. And I said, yes, I'm the heterosexual Rex Reed. <laughs> well, he howled because he hated Rex Reed. And then Digby said, tell him about your album. He said, what about your album, kid? I said, well, I did an album called It's Tough to Be White by uh, Dick Gregory. And he said, oh my God, I got to get that and show Sammy. And I was afraid to show it to him because it never went anywhere. It got horrible reviews. Matter of fact, the LA Times said it was the worst taste album ever recorded. <laughs> and I sent back a note and I said, you're supposed to listen to it. You're not supposed to eat it. <laughs> so then he sent me a letter after he heard the album. It's on my office wall when he says, you're all mine from now on. So whenever he had to write an angry letter to the editor, one is in um, Kitty Kelly's book. Uh, his Way, it's a letter to People magazine. All of those things were written by me. And when uh, Hubert Humphreys was dying of cancer, they're doing a tribute, they wanted Sinatra there. I wrote that, I wrote all those jokes. And, so, and at one time I said, I will do it for nothing. Every time I wrote, if I wrote one line, he sent me 10 brand new $100 bills. And he said, if you don't spend it, you're not working for me anymore. The stories here and how we parted company after three and a half years is 
that story's in here. Well, it's also. the development of television, what we know as modern television. I ah. mean, you were you rubbed elbows and maybe other body parts with pretty much everyone in the industry. Well, you know, that's the wonderful thing about the book. If you're interested in show business, there are fabulous stories. If you're interested, as you pointed out, the evolution of our society and our media and our politics from that day to this day, it's invaluable, but most of all, you know how many people there are in this country, George, who come from dysfunctional families or in Canada? Millions of us, millions of us. And for those people who have, you know, there've been a number of multiple teenage suicides in Las Vegas this past week and a half. Anybody who's having a tough going of it, but keep going, this book is an absolutely must read because when I was 46, and out of work, I gave up ever trying to be in show business again. The only time in my life, Georgia, I ever felt at peace. I was not under stress anymore. I was going to raise my son, a son I did not want. And the next day, I get a call from Digby Wolf. He said, I've got a deal at Westinghouse, and I hear you're trying to do this reality show. Come on over here. I go over there, and while I'm waiting for him, I bump into George Slaughter. And George and I had worked, uh, we were the four writers of the Laugh-In Revival. He said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here to see Digby. He said, about that reality show. And I said, yeah. He said, you know, John, I have a deal with uh, NBC. Four special, country versus city, country music versus city music, country jokes. He said, how would you like to do your reality show here? And he offered me a slip of paper, and on it, written on it was $5,000. And I said, what's that? He said, that's your fee as a performer. So I wrote back another note. What's my fee as a writer? $1,500. What's my royalty? This. Then what's my fee as a producer? And then he said, no, 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 you can't produce because I don't want to be sued by Danny Arnold and ABC because I know that's where you had it first. The first special went on. You might remember NBC had all their eggs in the um, Olympics basket. And of course, Russia and the United States were dysfunctional and they canceled that. So it aired, it was number 48 in the ratings, the one special. Got 8,000 pieces of mail, more than the most popular show in television. We did four specials and we did six. And then suddenly Silverman orders 22 half hours. A year later, we were the number one show in America with a 50 share. No show in American history consistently got a higher rating than real people. You were making, I think I read in this book, $22,000 an hour? $22,000 an hour and another 10,000 for the rerun. So actually it was over $30,000 an hour. And the first time I, met, met, I interviewed Mr. Garrison about his story, and the reason I did it is I'm not into conspiracies at all. I mean, when um, President Kennedy was killed, I had been booked into the Hungry Eye in, in, uh, in San Francisco, the best nightclub in America. It made Mort Saul, it made Bill Cosby, Barbara Streisand, Jonathan Winters, and all of a sudden John Kennedy is killed. And I did, shamefully, I didn't think I lost the president, I think I lost my act, like Von Meter. And in the film, you'll see President Kennedy talking about the first family in Von Meter. It just, uh, but you know what, George? And I'm a non-believer, but it's almost as though my life had been predestined or pre-planned, because all these great things happened to me by accident, and all the disasters were the things that I planned <laughs> really, really well. And I have to point out, as you will find in the book, things that happened in this book and happened in my life. I say, and I hate to use the word blessed because it makes it sound like I'm a religious or I'm, I hate to say it's divine intervention, but indeed it was. It's a fact. It's a fact I have to recognize and so I put them in. Were the you book. always going to write this? Did you take a journal? Do you keep notes or this is just, it no. was an epiphany, I got to do this? No, you know, it happened. Um, a fellow named James Griffith uh, is a publisher in Los Angeles and he had a small boutique company called Wordsmith Media, and he used to listen to me on the Jeff Rent show. I would be on every once a month, that time of the month on a Friday. And I would tell stories uh, about my life. And James called me and he said, oh, you know, I remember you from real people. I was eight years old 
and I'm glad to find you're still alive. But I'm listening to these stories. You must put them in a book form. Well, I, I'm a writer because I, I wrote Real People for three years. That's the reason it was a hit. I'll tell you quite honestly, because we were responsible for getting the uh, major, a major role played in getting the Vietnam Memorial Wall built in Washington, D.C. because of a story I did about a man in New Mexico whose son was killed the first week in Vietnam and he built a private memorial. We got the presidential citation for the Navajo Code Talkers. We did the first story in the Tuskegee Airmen. But get this, you know who John Walsh is? Yes. Yeah, yeah of course. Of John Walsh's son Adam had been kidnapped in a mall in Florida and beheaded. And he had gone on the Phil Donahue show and the Today Show all around trying to get what he called the Missing Children's Act passed because when his son was kidnapped, they could not, the, the FBI and the local police would not coordinate. There was no coordination. He felt there should be. So I heard the story and I went to George Slaughter and I said, George, I'm going to do this story and I'll do this story for nothing. He said, no, you're not. He said, it's an old story. It's been all over the news. And I said, but I haven't told it. He said, what are you talking about? I said, have you ever heard of the jumping frog of Calaveras County? Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, Mark Twain became a star writing that. I said, well, that was in the newspaper. How many times do you think a story about the contest was in the newspaper? Eleven times until he wrote it. When I write this story, just leave me alone. He said, okay, don't mention that the kid was beheaded. So I didn't. Three months later, the Missing Children's Act was passed. John Wells sent us a note thanking us. When is your book signing in Las Vegas? It's Monday? Uh, it, it is Monday, April Fools. Actually, it's supposed to be <laughs> out April 24th, which is my next birthday, my 86th birthday. But I chose April 1st, April Fools, because George, honest to God, with the exception of the day my son was born and the day I met my wife, almost every day in my life has been like April Fool's. <laughs> so that's why the signing on April 1st.